Hello, hello. I'm so excited to be here. So excited to be back in the house of God. Who's seeing me for the first time in like half a year? Anybody? I know I hear. Okay. I feel your loss. No. <laughs> and to those in front of the TV, hello. Welcome to the service. Uh, I have something burning in my heart I want to share with you. So I'm so excited. So can we uh, begin by, with prayer? Come, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we commit this time to your hands. And once again, we ask, Lord, that by your Holy Spirit, you come and make your truth real to us. Make your truth as revelation to us, revealing them into our spirit, man, that we, we may walk out of this place changed by the encounter with the truth, the truth that sets us free from every bondage of life. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Bless our time together so richly, so richly, Lord, so richly unto your pleasure, unto your purpose, and unto your glory. We honor, praise you now in Jesus' wonderful name. And everyone say, Amen. 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 I'm excited because this is a very passionate subject. Those who know me over the years, you know, I'm very passionate over this subject of God's provision. And God has been really good in my life. And, and uh, so when they were doing, uh, they told me that they were doing this series on God's name. I said, can I chop? <laughs> Jehovah Jireh, or actually Jehovah Yireh uh, in, in Hebrew, you know. And I said, I, I really want to share on, on how the Lord will provide, you know. Um, this name came from... Genesis chapter 22, actually. The first time it was used was when Abraham, when Abraham obeyed God, brought Isaac, you know, and, and how God provided, you know, with a ram in a ticket, you know, and, and the provision caused him to, to declare the place to be Jehovah, Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide. It means the Lord will provide. You can go read the full context of it in Genesis 22. But I want to begin with this thought of how God is the maker of the whole universe. He created the whole universe. And He created the whole universe with many, many laws governing the laws of nature. Uh, laws that, that g governs how nature exists, how the universe operates, how life perpetuates, how, how, how His creation functions. There are many, many laws that God created this universe with, right? And laws both in the natural realm and laws in the supernatural realms. Today, some laws we are very familiar with, others we are not familiar and even ignorant of. For example, uh, the law of gravity. I think everyone here has some degree of uh, knowledge about the law of gravity. Some of you fight it more than others, you know what I mean? <laughs> some of you are subject to it much more than others. <laughs> uh, you know what I'm saying? All right? Because we interact with it. We adapt to this law on a daily basis. We're very familiar with it, but other laws, we're not so familiar. Laws of thermodynamics, laws of planet, planetary motion, all that. Woman to say, I mean, we ignorant people like us, we don't know those, you know, heavy duty laws, right? And so we're familiar to it to the degree that we interact with it. On a daily basis, when we take an elevator, we, we, we walk up the steps, these are ways we adapt to gravity. We overcome it in order to get to higher elevation, all right? So we're familiar. In the Bible, we can read about various laws too. We can come to learn about. Spiritual laws especially. What would be one spiritual law in the Bible that you are very familiar with? Just shout it. The law of? All right. I know you're going to say that. That's the most, you know, that's the most familiar uh, uh, spiritual law, right? Yes, yeah. Yeah. That's the most spiritual law. Most familiar spiritual law. The law of sowing and reaping. What you sow, you will reap. And according to the word of God, this applies in the natural realm as well as in the supernatural realm, even in the spirit realm. What you do, you will receive back. What you sow, you will reap it back. Right? So today, what I want to do is, is to share something with you that I'm excited about as I read the word of God and rediscover this law. I want to zoom our attention on a law of provision. And I, would call, I want to call it a higher law of provision. If, there's a, if I need to have a second title for this message, I want to call it the higher law of divine provision. Because some laws, because laws are not all equal. There are lower laws and there are higher laws. Let me explain what, what I mean by that. The higher laws, I refer to laws that when you operate in it, it, it actually supersedes the lower laws. It has a greater force, a greater power. And then it, 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 it annuls the effects of the lower law. 
right? Uh, a good example would be back to gravity again. Gravity as powerful as it is, as it is, as pervasive as it is across the whole, I mean, acting on the whole, on the whole earth. A, a force that pulls down everything towards the center of the earth, right? As powerful as it is, hmm, we can actually create a, a counter force that's greater than that. The law of lift. Uh, by, 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 by observing certain aerodynamic laws, you know, actually it's, I think it's called Newton's third law of motion. You know, the, the basis is there. Where you create there are certain di aerodynamics where, they, where you, you can tap into the create a counter force greater than the law of gravity. Uh, so that's, how, that's what explains for how aeroplanes, you know, tons of metal can defy gravity and take off into the air because you have learned to operate a certain law that is more powerful than the law of gravity and can actually overcome it. I call them the higher laws. Not all laws are equal. Now with that, I want to zoom in on a subject of provision. There are actually higher laws of divine provision that many, many Christians do not know about. And, and even as I read the word, I get excited discovering that because I realize that, wow, it's, for me, it's fresh all over again, you know. Fresh all over again that, there is this realm that we can walk in divine abundance that, that if we do not know how it operates, then we will be like the rest of the world operating by default at a lower level of sowing and reaping, for example. Using your hard work to gain something. Or, and I'm not saying that you're not, <laughs> not, uh, 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 not having to work. No. Give, give me a chance. All right? Let me explain. All right? Because the world is a fallen world. Or it operates by a certain principles and laws, you know, that 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 everybody operates by default. But I want to show you from from the Bible today, from the Word of God, that there are higher laws that God wants you to operate in that actually cause you to walk at a different kind of abundance that is supernatural, that is divine in its nature. That means it's from God, or and it, it causes you to be distinct from the rest of the world. You want to know that? You know, I, I really want to share this with you because this is so relevant, especially when we come to this time, this time of human history when we're struggling with so much economic chaos and, and I, I, I know it's going to get worse in the days ahead. And there may be some relief, but ultimately it's going to go down, down, down. All right? and, and, I, and I really want to ask of you, all of you here live with me and all of you on the screen, Please listen with an open heart because I really feel the urgency on God's heart to want to tell His people, you've got to learn how to operate at a higher plane in the days ahead when it comes to divine provision. All right, so with all my heart, I'm going to preach this message and asking the Holy Spirit to cause it to fall into you in, in a way that will bring about much fruitfulness in your life. All right, let's look, let us examine how what the origin of this. We want to go first to Adam and Eve before the fall. That's when you see the see God's original plan of abundance for man. You see Adam when he was created by God. Adam was given work. Adam was given work, right? Work did not come after the fall. It came before the fall. I think this was in Genesis two fifteen when God told Adam. The Bible says, and the Lord uh, uh, placed Adam in the garden to manage it, to till it, you know, to 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 keep it. To cultivate and to keep it. The word is very interesting. I've mentioned this many times before, and I'm gonna say it again. The word that the Bible uses in the Hebrew, and God placed Adam in the garden to, to cultivate and to keep it. The word place is very interesting. It's a Hebrew word, Noah. Noah is the is the name of Noah. Yeah. And you know what's that meaning? Rest. And God rested Adam in the garden to cultivate and to keep it. It's interesting. That means in the beginning, Adam's work was so restful, so fruitful. There's no strain, no strife. You know, he doesn't have to sweat. He doesn't, he, doesn't, he doesn't have to strain himself in any measure. It's just very pleasurable. This is what is God's portion for us. A life doing something pleasurable, restful, abundance is what we reap out of it. Satisfying is... You know, that picture of man before the fall. That was God's original intention and design. 
And, but we also know that it didn't last very long, all right? Um, Adam was in the beautiful, blissful state of being, enjoying his work, enjoying abundance. Every day, he, he walked with God. In the cool of the day, they date. The, the, the Bible says, in the cool of the day, he, his wife, and God will walk together in the garden. It's a picture of how, even right now, it's God's plan for you. You as a household, blessed, united in Him, experiencing blessed, blissful relationship, one with another and as a family with God and enjoying God's super abundance, divine, divine blessings. That was a picture. Unfortunately, when Adam and Eve sinned and rebelled against God, this whole picture degenerated. It broke. The sin of man brought the curse. But before we come to the curse part, I want to remind you, in the garden was where you saw God's original plan. And, and that's the first glimpse of God being Jehovah Jireh, the Lord who provides for everything. What He provided for Adam and Eve was beyond their ability to exhaust. Inexhaustible inheritance and provision. That was God's original plan plan, which is what he has for you today in Christ. I'm jumping ahead of myself right now. See that picture. After the fall, things changed. After the fall, oh, the curse came in. Curse is the absence of blessing. I've said this many times before. Just like death is the absence of life. So death did not come from God. Curse did not come from God. Death is just the absence of life which comes from God, right? Jesus said, I came that you may have life and have it abundantly. All right. And likewise, curse is not from God. Curse is the absence of blessing which is from God. And so man plunged, mankind was plunged into the state of curse after Adam and Eve left God in rebellion, in a state of unbelief. There's a very sad moment. It's recorded in the Bible. And, and, and we, we, we see the devastation of sin ever since. Genesis chapter 3, verse 11. And he said to, to, to the man, because you listened to your wife and ate from the tree about which I commanded you, do not eat from it. The ground is cursed because of you. You will eat from it by means of painful labor. This is when painful labor came in. What was no longer blissful and enjoyable? Oh, some of you are already nodding, really. <laughs> okay, 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 I have a good news for you today. All right. By means of painful labor, all the days of your life, it will produce thorns and thistles for you. So in the Bible, thorns and thistles is a picture and a representation of curse. Hmm, I have a thought. That would mean that originally durance is smooth like watermelon. Before the fall, Adam really messed things up, man, big time. All right, now the ground, because of the curse, the ground would produce thorns and thistles despite the painful labor now. And, and God said, you would, and in that way, you would eat of the plants of the field. You will eat bread by the sweat of your brow. Well, now there's strain. Now the production has plunged, labor has become painful, and now there's so much strain and strife just to extract provision through their work. All right. And it says here, you, you will eat bread by the sweat of your brow until you return to the ground. Since you were taken from it, death came in. For you are dust and you will return to dust. So the fall brought about the curse. And ever since then, mankind had to labor and toil for provision. That is a result of sin. I want you to see this very clearly now. And henceforth, mankind live in sin consciousness and operate by the law of gaining sustenance or obtaining provision through painful labor and toil. That's directly a result of the fall of man. Now we look at what Jesus did. Jesus came to bring salvation and restoration. How? He put on, he, first he took off his divinity, his God. He put on humanity. And he came live as, as an Adam, as the last Adam. He came to live as an Adam. Uh, Adam is being red, it means made from the earth. He lived a life on behalf of you and I and the rest of the whole world. 
in sinlessness and in perfect righteousness. So giving no room to the curse giving no room to the enemy's dominion in his life and, and thereby also winning back everything that was originally given, bestowed upon man by God before the fall. Jesus represented you and I to live that righteous, perfectly righteous life to qualify again of God's original blessing, like that state of bliss in the garden before Adam fell. That's the wonderful work of our Lord Jesus. 2,000 years ago, well, we're going to celebrate it all over again this coming Christmas, how God came down, took on divinity, was stripped off of Him, and He took on humanity. He came now to reach down to man, to live a life that you and I cannot live, that perfectly righteous life, and to qualify for full restoration of the original blessing and design of God for man. In the state of sinlessness, the Bible says the righteous died for the unrighteous. He then offered of himself to be crucified on the cross and to bear the consequence and the price and the, and the punishment of sin on behalf of all mankind. And the price is death. And he took on death by way of crucifixion to pay the price of sin on behalf of every human being that ever lived on earth and ever will live. One perfect man died for all imperfect souls, all humankind, once and for all. He dealt with the issue of sin, died on the cross, paid the ultimate price and the complete price. He then resurrected from the dead to bring back resurrection life, eternal life. That's the redemptive work of Christ in a nutshell. That all who believe upon Him will not perish but have everlasting life. All of us can be restored back to God because of the redemptive work of Christ, that by believing in what He has done for us, God gives back to us the original life He intended for, for mankind. What a way of salvation. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Just, I, just take a moment and just thank Him. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God, for reaching out to us and paying the absolute and the complete price for us to be able to be restored and reconciled absolutely, completely. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus, for paying the price. Now we want to zoom in on this aspect of his redemption. He not only took away sin from you and the punishment of sin, which is death and eternal separation from God, he also, in his redemptive work, took away all the devastation of sin, which includes the curse of lack and poverty, the curse of the barrenness of your womb or even the, in, the barrenness of your business and enterprise. All these are part of the curse. I'm going to zoom in on that today because God is Jehovah Jireh. He's the one who will provide. He's the one who brings abundance and provision. Amen. It's part of Christ's work, redemptive work to bring Break every curse of poverty and lack from our life. I want you to let this sing into your heart afresh today, no matter how long you've already believed the Lord. Because many Christians, unfortunately, never truly come to realize the law, or rather the higher law of provision, and they operate at the same level with the world. And that's why when the recession hit, they hit just as bad as the rest of the world. You're not supposed to be in that, in that kind of a state because you are a people separated unto God and to live at a higher plane than the rest of the world so that your life might be a testimony of the reality, goodness, power, and, and the blessing of the Lord. Amen? But the fact that many Christians don't live in that plane shows us that they don't understand this higher law. So they operate by default, the law that traps the whole world under. What's that law? Painful labor to exchange for provision. And so we, I we 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 chong we 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 strain of ourselves and we 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 embrace such uh, philosophy that you got to to win it all, get it all, can it all, sit on the can, you know. I mean, yeah, we compete, we we fight like the rest of the world without a sense of knowledge of what God truly has for us. 
that kind of blissful life, living in a place of striveless abundance, which I want you to rediscover today if you have never discovered it. Or you have discovered it before, but today you have already backslidden into a worldly operation in this arena. Today you repent and come back to live in the realm that Jesus has made possible for us. Because of what he has done for us, Jesus made some very stunning statement, very challenging statement about how we should live life right now which I want to recall from the gospel. I know these are scriptures that we are very familiar with, but when I read it afresh in these new eyes, with new eyes, it ministered to me all over again. And it challenged me all over again. Do I operate in that realm? You know, I call them challenging statements. All right, I want to start with the first one. Challenging statement number one. Jesus said, so I want it to challenge you. And let you do an inventory check on yourself, a reflection. Really? I know I'm familiar with this scripture, but really am I living in this scripture? That will show you whether you are living in the higher plane or not. And then with all this statement, I'll bring you to what is the higher law. All right? Now, Matthew chapter 6, verse 34, statement 1. Jesus says, Therefore, don't worry about tomorrow, because tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough troubles of its own. Yeah, bro. <laughs> really? How many people, even Christians, live in constant worry and stress? Really? I mean, be honest with yourself. Really? Do I live in this? In fact, you know, many, many people, because of such stress and worry, oh, Singapore is known to be the most stressed out people, right? They did a survey a couple of years ago, you know, and the bottom of the table, the most stress, the happiness uh, 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 meter, we, 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 are, we are wiping the floor on that list. All right. Really? And yet Jesus said we are supposed to live like, there's no worry for tomorrow. Let that sing into your heart. A lot of sicknesses today actually are from worry and stress. You do know, right? Statement number one, let it hit you between the eyes. Right, to rediscover, really, are you living in what's God's best for you? Are you living in the fullness of what Jesus has paid with an awesome price of his own life and blood to purchase you? Are you? I want to challenge you to rethink. Or even if you think that oh, today I'm already not bad, you know, would you let the word challenge you to a higher place that you might be a blessing to many more others? Statement number two. Luke chapter 12, verse 22. Then he said to his disciples, Therefore I, I tell you, don't worry about your life. What you will eat or about the body, what you will wear. For life is more than food and the body more than clothing. As it is right now already, people are already worrying about what to eat for dinner already. <laughs> Repent. All right. What is Jesus saying? In fact, Jesus is admonishing us to be, do not be concerned about temporal things. He's challenging us to another realm, a higher way of life where you're mindful of the heavenly things more than these earthly temporal things. Unfortunately, many of us are trapped in the very temporal things. How does he expect us to survive if we don't worry about something? <laughs> I mean, Singaporeans are, are, we are professional in this. We are, we are not warriors, we are warriors. Many of us. That's why it's called kiasu, kiasi, kiambo. Kia is stress, you see. <laughs> I'm afraid of losing out, afraid of dying, afraid of, 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 of uh, 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 losing the game or losing my resource, losing my place in the company, my position. And there's a lot of fear. And really, and Jesus said, no, don't live your life without such worry. And you might be thinking, Jesus, oh yeah, well, really? Can we really live life like that? I want you to know Jesus is really challenging us to live in a different plane from the rest of the world. And it's going to make a, it's gonna be, make a lot of difference for you in the days ahead, in the months ahead, with what is going to come upon the world. This, all this will come alive for you in a whole new way, really. Let's come to the third statement. Luke chapter 12, verse 24 now. Consider the ravens, Jesus says. They don't sow or reap. 
Why did you, you say that? Doesn't this contradict what is said in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6? If you sow sparingly, you reap sparingly. If you sow bountifully, you reap bountifully. Is this contradicting, contradicting himself? You know, that's also the word of God. Okay, let me read the whole thing. Consider the ravens, they don't sow or reap. They don't have a storeroom or a barn, yet God feeds them. Aren't you worth more than the birds? So you have to ask yourself, why did Jesus put this verse in the Bible? Was it so that we know how much God loves birds? Or is this some key for bird keeping? <laughs> Obviously not. Actually, I do have birds at home. I have chickens, I'm going lay eggs. Surely there is something more that Jesus is telling us about. Living by God's provision. The focus here is not on the birds, actually. It's on a way of life. And you know what? Most birds, I would dare to say, not all birds, live at the mercy of whatever food they can find that nature provides for them. Because they forage, right? They don't, they don't prepare or store for the future, actually, the birds. They just seem to survive pretty well by God's creation and care. Jesus is challenging us to a certain mindset, a certain belief system, a certain paradigm of life. That, that, that you know, this concept even about sowing and reaping, sometimes even churches and ministry can cross a certain boundary of making people, you sow and then you reap and then you must do this and then you gain something, you know. And actually that can also be at the lower level of like the world. Because Jesus is challenging us even to birds, they don't sow and they don't reap. They don't have barns to store, but they live such blissful life. There's something here that he's challenging you and I, that I want you to rediscover today. The, the way of life that is so peaceful, so sure and confident of our Father's character, nature, love, compassion, faithfulness, and His divine provision that cause your life to be blissful, to live in a state of peace and yet experiencing a supernatural abundance that is not by human effort. All right, so stay with me. I'm not saying sowing and reaping is not is, is, is a lower, I'm not saying that. There's another realm where you sow by the Spirit of God and you reap a hundredfold every time. It's a different realm that, that, that is based on something that I call the higher law, which I will come to. All right. Jesus' focus is really on that higher law, all right, that he wants to bring you and I into. And this is going to be very important in the days ahead. What is Jesus saying? What is better? What is that higher place? Jesus is inviting us to a life of such trust in the provision of our Heavenly Father. And this is where the higher law is embedded in the words of Jesus that many miss when they're reading the Bible. And I'm going to come to it now. Statement 4. Statement 4, Luke chapter 12, verse 27. Consider how the wildflowers grow. They don't labor. Eh? Now he's using the word labor. Just now he challenges the concept of sowing and reaping just to be able to get what you want. Now he's talking about labor. They don't labor they, or spin thread. Yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all his splendor was adorned like one of these. Now, this is parallel. Now, I'm not asking you that you don't have to labor, right? Because the Bible also says you can actually quote, but, but, but the Bible says that let him who don't work, let him not eat. That is true. So you Yeah, if you don't work, you don't eat. The Bible does say that. Yet the way Jesus used this example, they don't labor. The wildflowers, they don't spin. That means they, they don't make textile. But yet they have such beautiful clothing. It's parallel to, if, you know, if you don't work, you don't eat. But they did work and they eat. They didn't spin cloth and they have beautiful attire. That is a place that Jesus is challenging you today to have such intrinsic trust in the Heavenly Father. That He's your Heavenly Father. He will never leave nor forsake you in the, in the area of provision. By the way, go do a word study on that scripture. He will never leave nor forsake you. It's about money. It's about the fact that, you, you know, don't be given over the greed, you know. And, and, and don't you know that He will never leave nor forsake you. He's talking about provision. That God will never leave you in the area of providing for you. Because His nature is Jehovah Jireh. 
the Lord they will provide and provide so richly and so abundantly to His children. And today, my mandate here is to remind you afresh of the aspect of God's nature that He wants you to know, to d discover and even rediscover and especially in the light of those days that we're going to head into in the, in, ahead of time. All right, this, be, this way of striving, straining to gain something and, and oftentimes it seeps into our even Christian context and doctrine very, very insidiously and we actually are living at a lower level of lacking rest in our heart, using, you know, using our own ability to try to gain something or to provide for ourselves. And God wants you to know that is not rest in Him. That is not His best for you. In fact, in fact, He wants you today to know how you can trust Him in such a way that your work become pleasurable and bountiful. All right, with that, I'll come to the fifth. I'm, and I'm going to just share six, all right? Actually, I found many, many statements, but I'll challenge you with six statements. Matthew 18, verse 3, Jesus went on to say, Truly I say to you, I tell you, he said, unless you turn and become like little children, you will never enter the, the kingdom of heaven. Hmm. Here, Jesus introduces the concept of becoming like a little child and you come into God's bountiful kingdom and you will enjoy of the lavishness of his of his kingdom that is different from the world all right so embedded in his words are some very key concept here you need to come in like a child that means it first speaks of the fact that you need to be born again to enjoy that realm you need to be born again you come in like a child and then it it, it, it implies that secondly it implies you need to grow up when you come into God's kingdom, there's so many laws of the kingdom and how the universe works that God wants to impart to you so that you can advantage from them. Like, for example, the law of sowing and reaping. You know, yeah, uh, the law of, of winter and summer. And there are many things that God wants you to, to learn and grow up and, and knowing how to be an, and growing up into an adult in this kingdom. All right, so it implies that, you know, when Jesus say, like a child, you need to be born again. Two, you need to continue to grow in your knowledge of Him and God's heartbeat and character and what's God's plan for you. The more you align with Him, the more you enjoy your full privilege as a kingdom citizen. The much privilege as a kingdom citizen. In fact, the Bible says every one of us, we are an ambassador of heaven. All right, ambassadors are very well provided for. Just look at every ambassador, you know, when they come, they never live by the resource of their destination nation. They live by the riches of the ascending nation. And an American ambassador may be living in Cambodia, but his house is the standard of America. It is his, his, his huge uh, mansion. All right, it, they, they are provided from the ascending country. We are ambassadors of heaven. We may live in this world, but our resource is boundless from the other realm called the kingdom of God. Amen. And Jesus said, you've got to come in like a child and grow up and know your full rights and live in, your, the, in, in the fullness of your true identity in Him. With that, we come to the last statement and the higher law will, come, will pop in now. All right, Luke chapter 12, verse 29. Back to Luke 12 again. Don't strive, Jesus says, don't strive for what you should eat and what you should drink. And don't be anxious. Now, if God repeats it over and over again, it's not because He's naggy. It's always because He knows you need it. It's so important that people can miss it. They can miss it. You know, and he, he repeats it again. And he repeats it from another perspective. And he went on to say this. For the Gentile world, people who don't know God, they eagerly seek all these things, all these temporal things, basic things. And your father knows that you need them. He wants you to know. Do you know that God knows every need? Every need, everything that concerns you, even the tiny, little, itsy little, bitsy little thing, he knows. Someone here may be worrying about your company not being able to be sustainable and you're worried about that. Another person may be worrying like, my hairline seems to be going higher. Do you know God is also concerned? Whatever you, that, 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 that you're concerned with, God is concerned. That's why the Bible says he even knows the number of hair on your head. He, he knows your details. He knows your struggles. He knows your aspiration, your ambition. And He cares. And He knows your every need. 
And Jesus reiterated that again. He knows that you have need of those things. And then here comes the law, the higher law. Verse 31. But seek his kingdom. And these things, all these all these things that you worry about, they will be provided for you. That's Jehovah Jireh. Don't be afraid, little flock, because your father delights to give you the kingdom, the whole kingdom, not just some of the benefits, the whole kingdom. He wants to give it to you. But he wants you to operate at that realm where you can receive of that kingdom. It's called, seek ye first the kingdom of God. You know how this thing operates? See you next Saturday. <laughs> no, no, I shan't be wicked. All right. Jesus says that there's a better way, there's a higher way than the way we are accustomed to in life. I better, you know, you got to strive in order to win in life. And Jesus said there's a higher way. And many of us never got out of the old ways. We may become a Christian and we still basically the same paradigm we operate by. You know, and we are still stuck in, a, in the same worry, the same vicious cycle, you know, and, and not knowing how to tap into the other realm of the higher realm of, a, of supernatural abundance. Jesus says, seek ye first the kingdom. Jesus is indicating that God is oh, not only wanting to provide for you these benefits of the kingdom, He wants to give you the whole kingdom. If you just know how to seek the kingdom first, all this sub sub sorry, all this nothing, they're nothing. They will be provided for and much more. The whole kingdom God wants to give you if you just aim for the right thing in life. We're supposed to be God's special people, but how come we don't live special life, many of us? Because we don't operate in this realm. And we still struggle crawling on the ground like the rest of the world, you know, groveling to find some grub. <laughs> you know, when actually God said there's a higher way. There's a life and life more abundantly, Jesus says. I came that you may have life. He says the devil is the one who came to steal, kill, destroy. But I came, that, I come that you may have life and have it abundantly, abundantly. I want you to let that sing into your heart abundantly, abundantly. He wants to take out your poverty mindset. It limits you. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Bible says in the book of Proverbs, all right, what you believe and think, your paradigm can actually limit you or even blind you from God's provision and what God wants to do through you. And that's why many people, Christians, are living like the rest of the world. We've been so dumbed down that, that we're not aware there's a higher, not aware that of the higher way of living in life. And today, God wants you to discover and operate by this higher law. What is this higher law here? What, what is it that 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 can cause you to operate above the rest of the world. I'll give you a very, very uh, um, direct example. Mm. Peter, Apostle Peter, one night he was in a boat, right? And he saw what looked like a person on the water. You know, and, 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 and Peter asked, Lord, is that you? Is that you? He, he, he asked, was it Jesus? It was Jesus, right? And Jesus said, yes. You know, and he said, if that's you, bid me to come. He said, bid me to come. And Jesus just said, come. And what happened after that? And he walked on the water towards Jesus. Wait, if you go by the law of surface tension, weight, gravity, I mean, it just doesn't make sense. All these are already the laws of the dynamics of nature, right? And he was walking on the water. So, so we always say, why oh, Peter walk on water? And Peter walk on water. Actually, he didn't walk on water. Because if he walked on water, he would have sunk. He didn't walk on water. What did he walk on? The word. One word. Come. A fresh word, a revelatory word of the moment, the word in season. This is his instruction, come. That supersedes every other natural law. I want to remind you, God is the one who created the universe with his words. Right? Let there be light. And there was light. And then he, he created the whole universe with his words. His words is the law. And now, he, when he says this word to you, there's a word in season for you, it supersedes every other natural laws. Because he's a creator of the laws. He was the original lawgiver. 
He spoke the universe into existence. And that's why when He speaks a word to you, it creates everything that word consists. When He gives you a vision, Gina, I want you to pioneer that business. Do you know in that one word is embedded all the resource, creativity, people, low bank, connection, money, uh, investor, everything is embedded in that one word. Pioneer that business. Because His word creates. His word is the law. You understand that? That's a higher law, what God is saying to you now. No wonder the Bible says this. The, no wonder the Bible says in, in uh, Hebrews 1.3, He's the one that upholds all things by the word of His power. His word is powerful. Say with me, His word is powerful. Say with me, when He tells me something, it contains everything I need for that word to come to pass. In the days ahead, he's going to tell you many, many things. Some of you he may say, invest in the industry. Some of you he may say, change your business model. Some of you he may say, I have another job for you. I know you're very cushy and very comfortable here, but I have another job I'm moving you to. He's going to tell you things that's going to absolutely change your world. And what he tells you can be, can be weird even for the time that you live in. Just like uh, Isaac. In a time of famine, he wanted to do what daddy did. Daddy, years ago, Abraham, his daddy, during the previous famine, went down to Egypt. Isaac wanted to copy because daddy went down and he did pretty well. So on the way to Egypt, God stopped him and said, I don't want you to go to Egypt. You will go to what is today actually Gaza Strip. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I mean, it's God for a second corner. All right. Gera, right? Or something like that. And he obeyed. It's so weird. Okay. So he went there. And in the midst of the famine and drought, God says, So invest. So he followed. Thank God he could hear God. And in, in the time when it was an absolute economic collapse, he had a hundredfold return. It's a hundredfold, 10,000, is it? 100%. It's a hundredfold return. 10,000. Who, who today can invest in an economic collapse, in a depression? In fact, it was a, the Great Depression of its time. You know? And within that year, he got a 10,000% return. It's called God's Word. God's instruction. That was higher law that he walked in. And so in this, so and this is what God wants us to do, to live by. You know, in the days ahead, what he says is gonna prosper you. Despite what the marketplace is screaming about. Can I hear an amen? And I'm gonna pray with you that you will hear God so clearly in the days ahead. I was so glad to hear just now some people's wishes. You know, I wish that you would hear God clearly. I say amen to that because this is my message today. All right, And that's what I felt it was a fresh thought you put on my heart. I never read this scripture with so much delight all over again because in the past, oh, so comforting. Oh, God cares for the birdie. Oh, and he cares for me. But today I realized, no, no, these are very radical statements. How to live life, especially as a Singaporean, you know, without worry for tomorrow, for what I eat, for my sustenance, for my family really there can be such a place of trust and rest in him and then he just supernaturally blessed the works on my hands yes really he wants you to catch his perspective not what you see with your natural eyes that is what is or judged by your natural senses and logic I'll give you a good example one time he told the disciples these words in John 4 don't you say there are still four more months and then comes the harvest in the natural it's not harvest time yet listen to what I'm I am telling you the fresh word the fresh word open your eyes and look at the fields because they are ready for harvest now that was not logical all right you got to know that it, it was an agrarian society right culture, you know, people farm the land and all that. They know very well when is uh, 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 harvest time. And he told the disciples, I know you look, 
you will say four more months, right, to harvest. Like, you know, I used to live in Dongbei, China, uh, northeast. The harvest time, Chiu So, is uh, September. September. This is like God telling them in May. Okay, now go harvest. Uh, hello? <laughs> May? They just, they just planted, just sowed in April. And then now May. It's not logical. And what Jesus is saying, look up and see it really is harvest time. That means look into his heart. Align with him. What he sees is the reality, not what you see with the natural. Amen? And I prophesy to you in the days that, hey, God's going to speak to you about your life, your career, your money, your asset, your, how you invest, how you manage, because what he tells you is the reality. And it may be counter to what the world is telling you. No, don't do that. And God said, no, I want you to plant it there. I want you to sow it into the kingdom. I want you to give to that person. I want you to look, uh, invest your attention into the industry. God's going to speak to you. And I want to join my faith with you that it's going to happen in the days ahead and that you will prosper so abundantly that men would have to give glory to God. It's not you. You're not that smart. <laughs> yeah. Amen? I want to prosper that way that people look at me, oh, this has got to be God. Lah. You see, so how Taiwan, how can you prosper like that? You know, you have no, nothing about the stocks and bonds, and yet you can just, just put one thing, mm, 1,000 times return. You know, I want to prosper in such a way that Jesus gets all the glory. And I want you to join your faith with me. Is it possible? Yes! With God, all things are possible. That's supernatural. Don't live the low life when you're designed for high living. Don't live at the default level of strife and gain provision when God says, no, I want you to live in the realm that you have no worry. You don't even have to worry about your provision because you'll be so well taken care of. And all your sins, all your thought and consideration are the bigger things of the kingdom of heaven that God wants to accomplish through your life. Amen? I want to live in that. I want to live in such financial freedom that, that I'm not even, no thought for my family's sustenance, but just be completely given over to his kingdom agenda. And I want to challenge you to, to, to come to that place with me. Amen? Shall we agree upon this? Because it shall be done, you know, when there's an agreement. Hallelujah. And so Jesus was actually challenging the disciples to look up. Don't look down. Look up and catch his perspective. And that is when. That is the truth. And that is the truth. And so ha, ha, it's a way of thinking. It's a lifestyle. There's a radical departure from our very earthbound norms that we, are, we have all been so used to. And, and God has a favoured status, a higher plane, a higher law of provision for His people that He wants us to experience. And I, want, and I want to pray with you that in the days ahead, no matter how rough the market is, you are going to laugh to the bank. <laughs> you are going to reap souls and, and, and kingdom results. You are going to be abundant, having an abundance for every good work. That is his financial plan for you, right? You want to make all grace abound towards you there at all times. With all sufficiency, you have an abundance for every good work. 2 Corinthians 9. So how, where do we begin? Where do I begin? <laughs> Jesus taught us how to get started on this journey. How? Matthew 6, verse 31. So don't worry. Say, again, he say, don't worry again. Boy, does he really repeat this... Uh, this uh, I think he knows that many of his people are worriers. Not warriors, worriers. He said, don't worry, saying what will we eat, what will we drink, what, what will we wear, for the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things. And your heavenly Father knows you, that you need them. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be provided for you. Let that sing into your heart. And I'm going to challenge you by the end of this message. I'm going to challenge you to talk to God and say, I will sing your kingdom. I will, by your grace, operate in the higher realm. I will, I shall discern your plan. I shall hear you clearly and I shall, by your grace, obey. Just like Abraham obeyed. Do you know? It was obedience that caused Abraham to even have the revelation of Jehovah Jireh over the obedience of sacrificing his son, you know, or the act of wanting to do it. And God said, no, I just want you to display your heart. That's all. I don't really want you to sacrifice your son. I've already given the provision. That's how Jehovah Jireh, the revelation, came to him. And so what is a concept here that Jesus is talking about? Seek 
first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. Actually, it's the number one commandment in the Old Testament that turned out to be the same first commandment in the New Testament. What's the, what's the greatest commandment, the first commandment? Yes. Phew, you, you do read the Bible. Hallelujah. Come here, Yaso. Deuteronomy 6, verse 5. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. That's the first commandment. It's actually still the same commandment in the New Testament. If you just love Him, you will do His commandments, right? If you just love Him, you will seek His kingdom, His, his agenda first, His purpose first, beyond your puny little earthly aspiration and, and, and plan. You will seek first, Lord, what is your purpose? Lord, how do, how you, how do you want to use me in this world? What's the position in society you want me to fulfill? What industry are you sending me to to touch lives there? Seek first his agenda. He, God says, if you had that kind of heart, be all your other needs, believe me, they'll be abundantly supplied for. I will cause you to have no worry. You will always have an abundance on your table. You will never lack of bacon on your table. God will see to it. You know, that means what? First thing first. Is, and the rest of the things will fall in place. It's called the first thing first. First thing is your relationship with Him. Just simply love Him. That's basically a very simple revelation. Just If you just love Him first, you will rise above the curse of having to toil for your provision because He will be your Jehovah Jireh. That's how it is experienced like Abraham was experienced. Obedience is both the test as well as the evidence that we are keeping the first commandment. Do you agree? It all comes down to that. I love God, you know. I'm a, I'm a God lover, you know. And then you, you do not obey Him in the simplest of things. You don't love Him. That's why Jesus said, if you love me, if. That's a condition. If you love me, you will do my commandments. You, know, you, will, you will seek to live my call that is upon your life. And that's why the Bible shows us that, shows us that obedience is both the test as well as the evidence of this love relationship. How are we supposed to love God with all our being? He says, you know, in the New Testament, you know, he says, I, I don't think I put it up. Let me see, did I put it up into the slide? I think I did not. You know, I, I just remember Hebrews 10, when he said in the New Testament, I will actually carve my, engrave my law on their tablets of their heart. That's Hebrews 10. Go back and read it. In the New Testament, it's no longer some laws on some tablets or some <laughs> external code of conduct. No. I will be speaking to you from inside of you. That's what it means. That's the higher law in the New Testament. So if the law, if, if the voice on the inside of you instruct you, this season, spend more time with your second son. He can have very specific instruction. You obey. That's the higher law. He knows what is happening in his life and he needs you there. Or, or I want you to, to, to take your wife out. Spend a few hours and connect with her. And all the wives say, Amen. <laughs> well, my wife is nodding very furiously. All right. I'm preaching to myself, hallelujah. <laughs> it's definitely a voice from God, she says. Yeah. Really, really, actually there is a relationship. It's actually about a relationship. God wants to be so intimate with you that he, when He speaks, you're like, huh, ma? You know, like, like, you know, like, I can't hear. No, no, God wants you to have a relationship with Him. So real, so intimate, so experiential on a daily basis that His instruction become the laws of life and abundance for you. That you prosper in everything you touch. Like spoken of, of the man in Psalms 1. Everything you touch prosper. That is His higher plane of living. Amen. It doesn't mean no sowing, no work. No, no, no. He will tell you what to sow. And he tells you what to do. And it will be great abundance when you just obey him. Can I hear an amen? amen? Amen. So the concept here is something that Jesus himself lived. All right? At 12 years old, he was at the temple. And he told his parents, he told his parents, he said, do you not know that I must be about my father's business? You know, when they're like, tzai tzai, why you do you not go back with us? And you, you, and all that. <laughs> and he's like, uh, do you not know I'm supposed to be about my father's business? Say with me, my father's business. That's called Sigi first the kingdom. 
are you doing his business or are you just having your own business? <laughs> are you minding your own business or are you seeking to know God's business, his agenda? That makes a lot, a lot of difference. The Bible shows us a, a person that did not want to do the father's business. I bring you to the Old Testament, Jonah. God had a business assignment. Jonah, I want you to go to the city of Nineveh. I want you to tell them to repent. Turn or burn, basically. Or the Ninevites are known to be they are Gentiles. And they're known to be cruel to the Jews. Cruel to the Jews. Jonah received the call of God. Say, tell them before or I'll destroy the city. And Jonah, was he willing? Was he willing? <laughs> Jonah was supposed to go to Nineveh. And Nineveh at that point is about like 550 miles to the east from where Jonah was. You know what he did? He went the opposite direction to the west. 2,200 miles. It's called Tashish directly opposite and much further than the, the, what was his distance to uh, Nineveh. That's called absolute disobedience. Not, not obedient. All right? And that's called, I don't care about my father's business. You take care of your own business. It's not my business. Basically, it's not my business. And he went the opposite. He took the ship, you know. And I want to show you this scripture. There's a revelation in there for you. All right? There's a revelation. Jonah 1, chapter 1, verse 3. But Jonah arose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish, 2,200 miles away, to the west. So he paid the fare. You get it now? He paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. So the scripture is very clear. He was running away from God, running from his assignment and business. He's called to pay for his own journey. He paid for it. Your play, you pay. God's will, his bill. That's a revelation. And you know what? What he paid for end up with disaster. You all know the story of Jonah. He went onto the ship and then the mighty storm and all that. And, and when you walk, opposite of God's plan, you can actually bring harm and danger to the people around you. And those people on the ship knew he was the cause of it. And he said, okay, okay, okay it's me, it's me. Because the, the kind of storm is so unnatural and all, people know this is supernatural. You know? And he's like, just throw me overboard. Just, just, just throw me. He was willing to die for it. He knew, he knew the cause was him and it was endangering everybody on the ship. And you know what? If you walk in disobedience, you can actually harm your family. Because God can actually want to bring you provision and the provision dries up because you, you disobey God and He affects the people around you. Yeah, this is a biblical example. He was endangering the lives of the people on the same ship. And so He said, yeah, just throw me overboard. And, and, and they, they threw him out. I believe that's a moment of his repentance. <laughs> let me die. Just let me... I mean, it's of course to tell them to throw him over what he was willing to die already. He was like committing suicide. He's like, I failed God, you know. And that's when God took over, when he repented. And God is so gracious because Bible says, well, God's will is God's bill. All right, remember that, nah? remember that. But what I will show you is the compassion. Oh, I tell you, the compassion of God. In fact, it was the compassion of God that Jonah knew and said, I know and I know what I know this God. Nah. I tell you, if I go and tell them, turn on, but and then if they really turn, nah, well, God really will forgive them. I don't want. Because he did say later on, I didn't want to do it because I know you're so compassionate. I don't want these lousy people to get saved. What an unwilling evangelist, you know. Do you know he was so unwilling? <laughs> By the way, that was what he was running from. He doesn't want the enemy to be saved. And when he repented and cried out to God, God spoke to him again. This is Jonah chapter 3, verse 1. The word of the Lord came to Jonah uh, uh, a second time. Oh, I didn't paste it in. 
Oh, I didn't pay. I'm so sorry. Jonah 3, 1. All right, let me read to you. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time and gave him instruction all over again about his original call. You know, it's like your GPS. You, you deviated from it. What does it say? Recalculate. You know, God tell him a recalculation. No, I now want you to go by another way now. Back to your calling because his calling is irrevocable. And I remind you, God's purpose and calling on your life is irrevocable without repentance, the Bible says. And when he repented, guess what? God provided free transportation. <laughs> when he took his own ship, he paid the fare. When he repented, God said, I will send you there in a very, very large seagoing vessel. Popeye. Yeah. Very grand, very large. It's called a whale. <laughs> and he took the basement compartment one, very dark below. Yeah. But free because God's will is God's bill. And God carried him there, albeit he arrived not spelling very nice. But God sent him there. God said, On me. <laughs> I'll pay for your journey back right there. And I know how to make it make you make up for lost time because he's a submarine. It's much faster than their seagoing ship. Yeah, and God has a way to do it. I mean, he's Tylo Milo, you know, our God. Yeah, and he's so full of compassion. And when he repented, God spoke to him all over again and restored his calling and provided for the transportation to go to get his job done. And guess what? He did that. He went there. He was so reluctant. He basically go and then, turn or burn. And he walked away. And oh, they turn. They turned. Nineveh repented before the Lord and he went even angry. <laughs> he came before God. I knew it. I knew it. I knew it. That you're so compassionate that if they would actually repent, you actually save them. And God said, this is my nature, my heart. And this is our Heavenly Father. Amen. Our Heavenly Father. Do you know today, God want to speak to you. Even you haven't already left him, left his calling, left you know, things that you knew years ago that you were supposed to do and today you've already left so far away to pursue the things of the world. But today if you will repent, don't worry. There will be no whale to gobble you up. It's, hallelujah, in the dispensation of grace. But God will bring you back right on the road again and make up for lost time for all that you have lost, for not walking in his purpose. Amen. Are you ready to walk in God's purpose? Are you, willing to, are you willing today with me to say, God, my food is, is to do your will. I am willing to, to, to live my life for your purpose. That's the ultimate point I want to make. When Jonah walked against God's will, he paid the fare. I want you to know my ultimate point is Jesus paid the whole fare for you to live that abundant life. He paid the full price for you to walk in full redemption of everything He's purchased for you with His precious blood. And that is a victorious life. That's a blissful life. That is an abundant life. That is an anointed life. He has, he has in store for you a journey so glorious that He has paid for with His own blood. That's our Lord Jesus. I mean, he paid the complete fare for you. And, and he's the one who lived his life as an example for us. He says in, in John 4, verse 34, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Have you finished what God wants you to do? I want to ask you. All he had to do, our Lord Jesus, to have all his needs supplied for was to simply be obedient to the Father. All that our Heavenly Father right now is asking of you is a desire to hear and to commit to follow. Just simple obedience. Trusting that He knows the best for you. He knows what He wants you to do. And when you are willing to do that, it creates a, launch, it creates a launching pad for you, for Him to perform mighty miracles in your life. Mighty miracles. I want to prophesy over you that 2021, you will prosper you will prosper despite no matter what turbulence is in the marketplace because God will position you always at the right place to glean from the best that He has prepared for you. Amen? The condition here is be willing to lose yourself in the Father's business. Just say, I live my life for you. My food is to do my Father's business. Are you willing? If you are, 
stand up. I want to join my faith with you. That you will live the most stupendously blessed life, living at the higher plane of superabundance that is divine, that is supernatural, because God has brought you into that place of such alignment with Him on a daily basis that what you feel, think, and want to do are actually His thoughts in you. That's called oneness. That's union with Christ in, every, in the true sense of the word. And today, if you're listening to this message, I want to tell you, you did, not do this, you did not come to this by chance. God loves you. God loves you. God loves you. God knows what is up ahead and He's setting you up to display His glory in the darkest of time. And to be His channel of blessing to many people in the times of need. That's what God has in mind. Do you know God wants to bless you, not just about you, because he is, it is because He wants to bless through you. He wants you, just like He spoke to Abraham, I will bless you and make you a blessing to the nation. The nation shall be blessed because of you. And I want to declare by faith, People around you shall be blessed because of you in the days ahead. People around you, they shall encounter and be so overwhelmed with God's goodness because of you. Because of you. God puts you in such a place of strength to be a blessing to many that you don't live after just after your own welfare and, 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 and riches and wealth that you realize everything came from God. And I'm here for such a time as this to be a channel for His blessing to flow to many, many people. Amen? And I want you to join your faith with me for that. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come before you today to acknowledge you are Jehovah Jireh, the Lord who will provide. And Father, we fix our eyes on you we will not be given over to fear, given over to stress. No matter what happens around us in the days ahead, we will fix our eyes on you and remember, and remember Jonah, and remember that as long as our eyes are fixed on you and our hearts set on your business, you will take care of us, you will take care of our whole household. You will prosper us without strain nor strife on our part. You will grant us of the divine wisdom on the journey of life. You say in a word that the steps of a good man are governed by the Lord. And you will lead us every step of the way with your word as a lamb under our feet and light under our path. Father, I, I want to join my faith with all my brethren in the house and all those tuning in over the internet. That Lord, you take away fear and stress from any one of us who might be fearful at this time, looking at the market condition. Lord, take away fear that can actually distract us from hearing your voice. But Father, draw us into intimacy, I pray. I join my faith with every one of my brother and sister right now and say, Lord, align us with you. Align our heartbeat with you. Father, let us look up and look onto the harvest field through your eyes and see the opportunity of the kingdom at hand and be given over, utterly given over, to the cause of the kingdom, the purpose of the Master, the destiny and calling of our Heavenly Father. Thank you, Lord. I join my faith with my brothers and sisters and ask of you, Lord, we declare by faith there shall be no lack in our life. There shall be no poverty in our household. Not when we are the children of the Most High. We declare, Lord, you are Jehovah Jireh. And according to your character, your faithfulness, Lord, you will see to it that we and our whole household shall be blessed. And we shall be blessed to be a blessing to many others. Thank you, God. Take away selfishness from us, self-centeredness from us, Lord, and cause us to be selfless like our Lord Jesus. Selfless in the days ahead. And that, that you can express your heartbeat through us unhindered. And the resources that you shall pour down upon our life and family and ministry and work and enterprise shall flow like a river through us to touch many, many lives around us. Thank you, God, for setting us up to be the channel of blessing for the nation in the days ahead. We thank you right now. Thank you right now. Thank you right now. I just feel led to pray for some people here you are under financial burden. 
Right now, Father, I lift up those who have financial burdens in our midst, Father, and that you will lift it off their shoulder and away from their heart. If there be heavy burdens that people are carrying right now, Lord, take it away. Jesus, you say that those who are heavy laden who come to you, you will not cast away. You say, you remind us, your yoke is easy, your burden is light. And that is the blessed life you're referring to in the kingdom. Draw every one of us into the kingdom living, we pray, that your glory may shine through us. In Jesus' mighty name. And all who agree say, Amen, 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 Amen. Come, just thank, thank, thank the Lord today for His word. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Free, free from stress, free from worry. I don't know, worry. <laughs> you are, you're well able to take care of your children. Well able. Come on, tell the one next to you, God is well able to take care of you. Well able. Well able. I mean, well able. You have been listening to a Petra Church recording. We hope that you have been blessed. For more information and resources, visit us at Petra.sg.